Oh boy. So, um, my brother, Ian, will be 49 at the end of May. And I feel very lucky and honored that he's still with us. He also is a survivor of lung transplant. He's been with this set of lungs for five and a half years, which is pretty exciting. So I don't know if we're supposed to have pictures up here or not. There we go. So why would I show a grainy picture from the 60s when I'm talking about Ian? Well, I think it's important that I go back and kind of set up the family dynamics to, to just set the table for how Ian fights his thing. That's dad. He's out in front. He's always out in front. That's uh, circa 1966. He's a graduate of the Naval Academy, 1967. His father was 1930, USNA. He was raised by his grandmother and mother. His father wasn't around. And um, interesting guy. Uh, we sat one day after my first child was born, and he was kind of lamenting the fact that they didn't have a playbook to raise children. I looked at him and said, a playbook? If I could write a playbook, Dad, we wouldn't be sitting here, I can tell you that. But then I realized the Naval Academy was his playbook. So that, that made it a little bit different compared to our friends when we grew up. Um, most people, when they put their kids to bed, they sing normal, like, kids' songs. We got anchors away. <laughs> and what do you do with a drunken sailor? <laughs> All three verses. Anybody know that song? Yeah. So that's mom. Air Force brat. Didn't live in the same place for more than two years growing up. So a little bit of military in our background. Interesting story, her father was a navigator with B-17s in World War II and Korea. He came home after um, the end of World War II when my mother was born. And um, my grandmother went to pick up his watch. When he got back home from duty, his watch wasn't working. So she picked up the watch for him. And you know that night at dinner, she said, well, George, what happened to your watch? He said, well, kind of got shot down over the English Channel a few times and got to swim. She said, well, don't you think you ought to, should have told me that at some point? She said, yeah, I'm just telling you now. So that's kind of the, the, the dynamics that we've got going on here. Unbelievably loving parents, but we're really not big into talking about feelings. So, by the way, the, the family picture here is uh, a fun one. We don't have too many of those. We're not big picture people. And it looks like Dad's smiling. By the way, his hair's too long. <laughs> he's not smiling. He's actually in pain. My, my brother on the left has a car in his right hand and just happened to run that right over his groin right before that picture was taken. <laughs> Uh, so I digress. So um, we moved to a town in Maryland called Frederick. I don't know how many people have heard of Frederick. Not many. Great place to raise a family. Great place to grow up. And it's also great that you're an hour from D.C. and an hour from Baltimore. So you get exposed to both cities. You also get the comfort and, and the fun of a smaller town. So Ian was born at Frederick Memorial Hospital. Didn't take long while he was still at the hospital to realize that they had a problem. So he got the free helicopter ride down to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. It was so quick that he was labeled Baby Boy Tisdale when he got there. He, uh, he got to stay for four months at Hotel Hopkins before he came home. Obviously, when he came home, that was kind of a big deal, and we celebrated, as only the Tisdales can. 
And um, you know, kind of life went on from there. We, uh, we'd always go down to Johns Hopkins every quarter to see Dr. Rosenstein. Burl, I hope you're watching us today. I don't think you're here. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a fun time. We'd get in the car, get the toys, and, and we'd ride down and tell jokes to each other. And you got to hang out in the, the waiting room at Hopkins, which, you know, we didn't know any better. We were little kids. It was hilarious. It was fun. And then Dr. Rosenstein would check Ian out, and we head back. And we kind of look forward to that trip. The good news is, even though Ian has one of those rare mutations that we're fighting for, and, and none of them are good, he kind of had a fairly uneventful childhood with this thing. If you remember kids born in the 70s, they didn't have that far advanced medication, so he took Viocase before every meal. Everybody remember Viocase? Had to mix it with applesauce. He just took it, didn't have a, I would have thrown a fit. And then postural drainage. Remember postural drainage? That was before the vest. Well, that was a big deal, because uh, we do it in the mornings, and we do it in the evenings, and it was usually Dad that did it. And even the weekends, we, we'd look forward to that, because weekends we got to watch cartoons. D Dad would always limit the, we, it had to be like Bugs Bunny, it wasn't, he didn't like the Smurfs or the train, it had to be old, old style, old school cartoons. We'd watch the news and a couple other things too, so we'll look forward to that. The other thing that was kind of fun about growing up in that household is that um, he got attention by saying funny stuff. So I felt like Ian and I were always in competition to, to say something funny. He always won. And I don't know what made me think of this, but I was on the plane out here yesterday morning and I thought, gosh, back in the mid-80s there was a cruise ship called the Achille Loro that was uh, hijacked. Everybody remember that? You weren't even born. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was terrible. The first thing they did, the hijackers did, was they pushed this very old man who was bound to a wheelchair off the ship. What, what an what a image, what a thought. So I, I don't know how long it took from the, the hijacking to when they actually were able to settle the issue. But we were watching the news, and the boat had just docked where it docked. And of course, they had the band, the 76 trombones, and all that good stuff, and all the elected officials who wanted to take credit for it. And the newscaster said, and Mrs. So-and-so will be the first person to leave the ship since the hijacking. And without missing a beat, without looking up, Ian said, she wasn't the first. <laughs> Real high brow humor there. So, you know, the, the, the kid was amazing in the sense that he, this, 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 this wasn't going to get him down. And he certainly wasn't going to tell us if it was getting him down. And I think part of that was to protect mom and dad. But he played football through high school. He actually wrestled. And pardon me for being a little graphic, but they, they'd have a bucket at the side of the mat just in case he, get, he would get sick through that process. Speaking of getting sick, he, he, it's not very much of a share. I guess none of us are. But one of my favorite stories was uh, when he was uh, with his, his buds, and they decided to uh, try to chew tobacco. He did need the bucket then. And I, I also learned about it because there was a volunteer in the community that does a lot of uh, coaching that, that was in the bathroom with, with Ian, Ernie Miller. And of course, Ernie says, you tried to dip, didn't you? And Ian said, uh-huh. He said, you're not going to do it again, are you? He said, uh-uh. So, you know, through high school, it would also be interesting because randomly I'd get questions from other teachers that had heard what Ian was dealing with, and he'd say, is he okay? I'm thinking, my God, they probably went to the encyclopedia and looked up what cystic fibrosis was. So, next phase is college. 
Ian took a circuitous route to, to get his college degree with a couple of stops along the way. He ended up at Maryland, University of Maryland, to, to finish up. And it's always great to visit him. I'd always come up and make sure we timed around an Orioles game or a Maryland football or basketball game. And it was just it had a great group of support with friends, et cetera. He was involved in a fraternity. But you could tell that he was starting to fade a little health-wise. So somewhere along the way, I moved to Atlanta to further my career in banking. And I loved Atlanta. Great area. I loved the bank I was working for. Somehow I volunteered to start coaching Little League Baseball. And boy, I could do that my whole entire life. And when you're down in Georgia, that's, that's like a big deal. Uh, I had a girlfriend, and I got a call then one day that said, hey, uh, just so you know, Ian's in the hospital. I said, okay, nah, he's probably going to stay a couple days. All right. Well, I guess that, that was a success in the sense that that was really the first time he had been hospitalized every night. But it was certainly the beginning of a lot of these visits to Hotel Hopkins. And um, I'm not sure whether 100% of my decision to move back home was Ian, but I know it wasn't zero. And I, I was pretty pleased that I made that move because I wanted to be around. I was also tired of the girlfriend. <laughs> so uh, fast forward, Ian and I end up living together for a period of time in our late 20s. And I remember somebody recommended I read a book written by Mitch Album called Tuesdays with Mari. Anybody read it? I, I, I wanted to read it because I always enjoyed Mitch Album. He was a sports columnist that wrote for the Detroit Free Press, and I always enjoyed his perspective. But it, it's a sad book, it, and what caused Mitch to write this book was that his brother, who's fighting terminal cancer, just opted and moved to Spain in some remote place and nobody, where nobody could find him. And the book is, it's a great read. Um, you'll cry through the whole thing. It's, it's about his Tuesday visits to a professor who's s slowly dying and, and the lessons back and forth that they learn. But after I read that, I thought, maybe I ought to ask Ian, like, do you mind, like, sharing? He said, sure, sure, I'll share. I said, well, what do, you, what do you mean? He said, well, just ask. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm not going to tell you stuff, but if you ask the question, I'll answer it. And I'm thinking, good. <laughs> I'm not even sure the questions to ask. So um, true to form, he and I were driving somewhere after wor work to run some errands, and I know exactly where I was when this conversation happened. South on York Road, Maryland State Fairgrounds on the right. And out of the blue, he says, hey, I went for my quarterly checkup today. I was like, okay, this is good. We can even be roommates, and I still don't know you're going for your quarterly checkup. I said, well, how'd it go? He said, no, oh, it went fine. He said, but uh, I've got a new dock. I almost drove off the road. I said, what? He said, yeah, I've got a new doctor. I said, well, what do they do with Dr. Rosenstein? He's been with us for 20-some years. Oh, he's still around. Well, that's good. Well, what's this new dock about? He did say that they hadn't had a new adult center that was just starting, and at the time I wasn't appreciating the success with that because I was so concerned we didn't have Dr. Rosenstein anymore. And he said, yeah, this guy's, uh, he's like us. I said, what? And I almost drove off the road again. I said, we're not going to see people like us for our medical care. <laughs> I can tell you that. He says, no, no, this is a guy that you can just sit and have a beer with. I said the same thing. We're not going to see a doc. We're going to sit and have a beer with. So he says, no, nah, he, he, was, he was great. He was great. He said, you know, he told me that at some point I'll make you diabetes with this. I said, really? Because, yeah, that's what he said. I said, well, when will that happen? He says, I don't know. I said, you didn't ask? He said, no. And that's kind of the way he, he, he deals with it. He'll... he'll He'll deal with it when it comes across his plate. And again, I'm not sure whether that's to protect us around him, the family, 
or, or that's his own thing, but, but I can tell you that he, he doesn't let this thing, never has, let him define who he is. All right, so um, I'm going to put a bookmark with Ian for a second. Talk about me. So going back probably 10, 15 years ago, um, I was going through some tough times. I was going through a divorce. Career was kind of turbulent. And just wasn't feeling right, feeling anxious. And Josie Schaefer, who's down here in the front, has been the uh, executive director for the Maryland chapter for 30 some odd years. Josie, thank you. She's been a great family friend. In fact, I probably hear more about what Ian's dealing with health-wise from Josie than I do from Ian. But she said, you know, you ought to go see somebody to talk to. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, like a psychologist. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, we sang what do you do with a drunken sailor and anchors away. We don't go see psychologists. It may be all right for everybody else. Then I thought, well, we did sing, what do you do with the drunken sailor? Maybe I ought to do it. <laughs> so, true to form, I show up and park the car, and I'm walking in, and I'm thinking, why? This is a waste of time. I should be doing something else. So I walk in this room, right out of central casting. You've got the big couch with the fluffy cushions, the chair, and then the desk, and Kleenexes all over the daggone place. And so we, I introduced myself and all that fun stuff. And I said, so I said, well, where do I sit? She says, wherever, the hell, wherever you want. I'm like, well, what do you mean? She says, well, you're supposed to be comfortable. So I don't, whatever. So we start talking, and I give her the background and everything in my life. And she said to me, she said, is there anything that's ever made you sad in your life? Have you ever had anything that's been tragic? I said, no, of course not. I mean, no. She said, are you sure? I said, I'm, I'm fairly positive. She said, well, just do yourself a favor and, and get, just close your eyes and think for two minutes. Well, I thought for two minutes. I bawled my living eyes out for 10 minutes. Just uncontrollably. I don't think I've ever cried like that as an adult ever. And uh, so I finally stopped. I did ask her if she could deduct that 10, 10 minutes from the bill. <laughs> Um, and she said, well, what, what, did, what, what did you think of? And I said, well, when I was 13, I was cut from the high school baseball team. It's very tragic. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, really? I said, yeah. But, but then when I, after I got the phone call, it was a Friday night at 9, I remember going upstairs and going to bed, and a couple minutes later, my mother came up and gave me a pep talk. She said, well, what did she say? She said, well, you know, we're Tisdales. We, we just dust this off and move on to the next thing. And so she basically said, well, you know, that's probably what triggered that memory is that you deal with tragedy and sadness by just dusting it off and moving to the next thing. And she said, that 10 minutes, that was stored up stuff from a, a long time ago. She said, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great thing to have, but you've got to know that every 10, 15 years, you know, if you don't just deal with these things, you're going to have this. I guess it's been 10, 15 years. I'm doing okay so far today. Um, so then she gave me homework. I'm thinking, okay, well, if I'm a business person, I could see me, I'm probably an annuity. She's already plotted out how many sessions I'm gonna need. And she's giving me homework, so I gotta come back for that. She made me watch Ordinary People. Anybody see that movie? If you haven't, don't, it sucks. <laughs> Kiefer Sutherland's in it. I forget whether it's Mary Tyler Moore or Sally Field, but some, some woman that fits that typecast of a mother. And, and it's, it's a movie about survivor's guilt. And it didn't take long for me to start watching the movie for me to realize what the heck, why she made me watch it. So, watched the movie, went back in the next week, said, I, I get it, survivor's guilt, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she tried to stretch out for more sessions. I, I was good with that, survivor's guilt. We're, we're, we're good there. So um, just, just knowing what it is that I sometimes deal with is kind of helpful. So thank you, Josie.
Thanks, Barbara, for helping me out with that. So it's interesting, when I did get up to leave, Barbara had said, do you need a hug? I said, a hug? I don't need a hug. What I need is a cure. So fast forward, I get a call in March, right about this time, from Ian. It's a ritual for us to go to opening day down at Camden Yards. And he called me and said, hey, um, you think you may be able to find me an extra ticket, like a, for a plus one? I said, plus one, what, what do you mean? Well, you know. I said, no, I don't know. He says, it's a girl. I said, okay. So I got to meet Aruna. And uh, I don't know if we have the next picks up, but uh, he, he, uh, he met Aruna. an angel. She obviously got to know Ian and what he was dealing with and managed to hang in. That little fellow in the middle there is their son, Calvin. I don't know whether it's true or not, but I'd like to think he was named after Cal Ripken. <laughs> a couple of years after they uh, met, they set a wedding date. Ian's health, by the way, continues to decline through this period. And as the wedding date approaches, it's pretty clear that this may not happen. And sure enough, it didn't. He ended up a couple weeks at Hotel Hopkins, right over the wedding date. So um, kind of a tough deal there. And I think that's when it really hit home for Aruna, what she was uh, in for. They finally did get married, thankfully. Um, Maroon is still an angel. And then they decided to buy a house in Old Town, Alexandria, a neat part of uh, Northern Virginia, if you've ever been. It's a four-story townhouse. Yeah, and I'm thinking, Ian, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but, you know, I don't see you running up and down the four flights of stairs that often. And make it worse before it gets better. And so sure enough, any time that he had issues, we had to, uh, he ended up staying with my parents in Frederick. He used to call it, he, was, he spent an entire winter there one time. He called it wintering at the Tisdales. <laughs> and he couldn't wait for 7.30 because that's when Jeopardy came on. <laughs> so, I mean, at this point, he, he couldn't walk two blocks without having to stop. And... Um, you know, part of the way Ian coached us to deal with this is just kind of deal with it as he comes, as I said before. So my parents have been very generous with the foundation, but they haven't gotten involved like many people here in this room that just pour your hearts out and just really get, get involved. And um, I've been involved with the foundation for a while because I kind of want to know what's coming and I kind of want to help. Um, and I certainly don't judge my parents, but I knew that at some point, lung transplant may be the deal. And uh, there's a business school case, that really, this, this actually happened, there's a, there was an oil rig in the North Sea that caught fire. And it was raging out of control, all the, the fire boats came, they even had a couple Dalmatians on each one of them, and uh, they couldn't put the fire out. Well, what happens with, when an oil rig catches fire is that the oil actually goes into the sea around the vessel, and you can either have a spot where the oil is only as deep as the top layer of the ocean, or it could go pretty deep, and, and if that catches fire, you then have to guess, am I going to jump in the place where it's only hopefully just a little deep, or is it really deep, and then I'm done skis. So it's a choice. I can either stay on the platform and know my fate, or jump and take my chances. That's kind of the way I thought we, I should be approaching this thought around lung transplant. And I better get everybody ready, because as you know, uh, there's a certain window that you've got to raise your hand and get on a list, because if you go too far, 
It ain't going to happen. So um, there was a lot of discussion with the inn and with the family as to how we were going to approach that. Luckily, we were able to get Ian and everybody comfortable enough with that happening. So I suggested to everybody that when we go in for the consultation, because what we do is you go in and see uh, Dr. Christian Merlot at Hopkins, he's going to have to go through all the information as to what lung transplant looks like. And it's not a pretty picture. So you, you might want to read ahead just so you're not shocked by, by what happens. And so sure enough, we go down to Johns Hopkins. We have a session with Dr. Merlo. Um, Aaron Tallarico is here. Aaron, where are you? So Aaron was in the room. Sue Sullivan also worked with Ian. She wasn't in the room, but she certainly um, heard about this uh, incident. So sure enough, we, we all cramped in a hospital room. Dad's leaning up against the cabinet. Christian's going through all the stats. And all of a sudden, Dad's eyes shut, and he starts sliding down that cabinet to the floor. He passed out at attention. And uh, luckily, he came to pretty quick, and um, he was fixed. But I, but I realized, boy, this is going to be really tough for everybody. This, this, is, this is at a different level than we've all dealt with. So we get on the uh, transplant list. There's a, there's a family that's involved with the Maryland chapter, the Seymours, who've been through lung transplant before. And I've spent a lot of time with them leading up to this to know that you're going to have false starts. You're going to bring everybody into the hospital. It's, and once you're there, you may, may find out that they've decided that the lungs aren't a fit after all. So you have that. There's, it's not like it's a convenient time. It's not like you can schedule this for Tuesday at 11. It's whenever their lungs are ready. And that's typically because something bad happened on a Friday or Saturday night. So it's O-Dark 100 Saturday or Sunday morning. So sure enough, I get a call from my mother. It was on my birthday at uh, 530 in the morning. I, I knew she wasn't wishing me a happy birthday. She's usually not up by then. And uh, she said, hey, I need you to come pick me up. Dad and Ian have just left Frederick. They're heading down to Hopkins. This is going down. So sure enough, we get to Hopkins. I'm making sure everybody understands, hey, this may go. We, we, may, we may have a false start here. You just got to hang loose. So Dr. Errol Bush is the, the doc that did the surgery, um, who I've gotten to know since. Um, finally takes Ian in. It's usually an eight-hour procedure. He was finished in six and a half hours. He comes out to the waiting room, tells us the good news. Errol's six foot four. I think I picked him up and carried him around the room a couple times. I did apologize later. But I also remember floating, not walking, but floating out of the hospital after that. And I just felt like the whole weight of the world was off my shoulders. Because as I was sitting in that uh, waiting room, I thought, Man, this doesn't work. Whew. I'm going to have to go see Barbara again. <laughs> so anyway, just a great, great story all around. And like I said, he's been five and a half years. And uh, you know, the downside is he can't eat red meat. And he can't eat seafood. Well, that's a little bit of a sacrifice if you grew up in the Maryland area. But given the trade-off, he's also running 5Ks. And we can actually walk a couple blocks. <laughs> So, I don't know, I just, um, it's, it's an interesting fight we have here, and um, I was with Mike Beatty yesterday, he and I had a chance to visit, and we're talking about the fact that this is a, this is a family fight in a lot of ways, too. And I don't know that I needed to watch a goofy movie to appreciate when I'm with the, the Clark family and I see Wells. I, I want to spend as much time with Wells' brother, brothers than I do. Wells and, you know, Austin Gordon is one of my favorites that I root for, but I also want to be around Kate Gordon, too. So, you know, I don't think, 
we need to worry about sub siblings sitting in the corner sucking their thumb feeling sorry about themselves. They really don't. But it's kind of nice to know what they go through. And um, so anyway, thanks for listening. I want to leave you with uh, two thoughts. Go Navy. Beat Army. <laughs> and um, we don't need a hug. What we need is a cure. Max. Thank you so much, Mac. I know Ian is so proud of you, even though he's not here. I'm sure he's online. Hello, Ian. Your care for your brother is so evident in that story. The pictures were amazing, and we appreciate you so much. I have loved getting to know Mac in this process. It's been amazing, and especially getting to know another sibling very well. Um, I'm not going to walk around as much because I'm wearing these. I can't feel my toes. So, bear with me. Um, I've also just gotten word that my niece Blair is watching online. She's five. So I just wanted to say hi to Blair and JD if you're there. <clears throat> so I never met my brother Joey. And I think that that's why it's been so tough for me to write this speech. It's really easy to talk about what we know. And in the past, I've had no problem talking about cystic fibrosis. I can rattle off stats, research, advancements, anecdotes with the best of them. I'm basically a walking textbook like most of you are here. I travel conferences, fundraisers, and I can convince anyone to donate to the CFF or the Joey Fund, no problem. And I think the reason why it's been really difficult for me to write this is that while my entire life has been defined by and intertwined with events that have occurred in this community, I don't have any personal stories about the person who's the inspiration behind that. And get this, I didn't even meet someone with CF until I was about 13 years old. Growing up, I didn't really know where I fit in this CF community because I didn't know my brother. I kind of felt a little bit like a fraud. But I think through VLC and my work within this foundation, I've finally found my role. And it's here with all of you guys. So, <laughs> my CF story is absolutely my story, but it's really a culmination of stories from all of you, your families, and this entire community. So Joey was born in 1974. He was diagnosed with CF when he was a few months old, and his failure to thrive prompted my parents to beg, insist on, and eventually demand better care for their son. He was a beautiful kid, popular, funny, athletic, athletic an incredible artist, and a writer. At the time, my parents had made the very personal decision to not have any more children, until they were able to test them for CF in advance. The scientific advances that had happened at that point are the sole reason that I was even given the chance to come into this world, let alone be on this stage. As soon as testing became available in about, what, 1985, 86, my parents decided to try for another child, hoping that Joey would be able to enjoy having a younger sibling. My sister Casey, who's also online, hi Casey, followed along two years later. Both of us are healthy carriers. While the prospect of a sibling was definitely intimidating for 11-year-old Joey, I've heard about how excited he was to be a big brother, both from my parents, my cousins, and from a bunch of his friends from high school. Which leads me to the greatest gift that Joey gave me, which is my name. Joey had recently read Frank DeFord's Alex, The Life of a Child, which at the ripe old age of 36, I can barely get through without completely losing it. So it's unclear how Joey was able to read this at 11. Most of you are familiar with the story, but if you're not, when Alex is, 
actually nearing the end of her life, she helps her nurse name the baby that she's expecting. And Alex chooses Kate. When the baby's born, after Alex has passed away, her nurse completes the name, Kate Alexandra, which is what Joey decided to name me. I would have loved nothing more to have met my brother. From what I've heard, he was a complete joy of a human, and I know he would have absolutely enhanced my life in every way. However, I do like to think that even after his death, he's still watching over the family, especially my parents. I'm not a religious person, but no matter what your beliefs are, I do believe that people can have an impact on your life after they pass. Sometimes there's no other explanation. You can call it faith or belief or whatever you want, but I've always believed that even though we never met, my brother has been looking out for me, dropping signs and nudging the scale just a tiny bit. Joey passed away when he was 12 in November of 1986, just three months before I was born. My mother was five months pregnant with me at the time. Just want to let that sink in for a second. She was five months pregnant. She gained no weight during her third trimester as she was obviously in a deep state of grief. I've thought about this so many times and I truly have no idea how she did it. My mom, also all nine, hi mom, is the absolute epitome of strength and grace and I can only hope to fill her shoes one day. And then there's Joe. I used to fall asleep to the sound of my dad making calls late into the night, following up on leads, cultivating relationships, consoling families who were frustrated or heartbroken. These calls are how he accomplished and accomplishes everything. He doesn't mention them to anyone, he just quietly cranks away until 2 a.m. every morning. Many of you here in this room have been on the receiving end of those calls, and many of you have learned how to fundraise and connect from the ultimate master of the trade. I know I certainly have. I made my entrance in late February, almost a month early. It was apparently the perfect model of an infant from the very beginning. <laughs> I ate, I slept, I didn't cry, I was happy all the time, and it was almost as if I knew that my parents couldn't take anything else. To this day, my mom calls me her miracle baby. Even though they were deep in their own grief, they simply did not have the option to let it consume them. And while I would love to take credit for my own behavior here and say it was completely intentional on my end, I obviously can't, I was a baby. <laughs> but I do like to think that this was Joey's doing. Bring me in early, making sure that I not only made my first months as easy as possible for them, but also bring them joy that they needed. My sister Casey, on the other hand, was not quite as easy as I was. But I think Joey had probably decided that they were up for the challenge at that point. I made my very first appearance in the CF community at the tender age of three months at Joey O'Donnell Day, which I think we have a slide with that. My earliest memories, that's me in the stroller. My earliest memories are at Joey's Park, which is a playground that was built in memory of Joey by his friends, family, and community right after he passed away. I washed tires at the build when I was three, and both Casey and I attended the school that it was at, Wimbrook, and grew up on that playground. In 2012, we hosted a full rebuild of the park, and we had the exact same turnout. Instead, this time, Joey's friends would bring their own children along, telling them all about their extraordinary friend. As my sister and I grew up, Joey was never kept a secret. He was celebrated. Pictures of him around the house, frank discussions about what happened to him, celebrations of his birthday, observations of his death. The impact that it left on my parents was palpable, but I found that they used their experiences to improve the lives of those around them. Whenever a family in Boston lost a child, they were immediately sent to our house to have a talk with my parents, the club no one wants to join. But both of them had felt the isolation and fear from other parents that comes with losing a child, and they couldn't bear to let anyone else feel that. Throughout the years, I've thought a lot about the sibling dynamic between Joey and myself and the implications that it's had on me. I am a CF sibling, just like Mac and just like many of you here. But I will admit that at times it's gotten fairly complicated, perhaps only in my own mind, because I never had a semblance of a personal relationship with Joey. I grew up thinking of him as my older brother 
And then when I turned 12, he suddenly became my little brother. I spent a lot of time thinking about birth order and how while I'm technically the oldest sibling in my family, I was certainly not the firstborn and I functioned much more like a middle child. My identity in the family changed and I didn't know anyone else my age who also had that experience. You never realize how often people ask about your siblings and birth order until you have to explain that yours has died. I'm really glad that Mac brought up his own experiences with therapy because it's something that I was originally not gonna mention. People tend to get uncomfortable when you're talking about that. But trying to work through why I'm such a people pleaser to the point of it being incredibly detrimental to my own life at times. My doctor mentioned that it was probably due to my miracle baby role. And while I do love that title, it's also a bit of survivor's guilt. I grew up with the understanding that I was the happy, sparkly glue and healthy glue. It was my job in the family to, take, to keep the, pace, the peace to take care of my parents and those I love. I was lucky to not only be healthy, but to just to be alive. I didn't have the right to complain about anything. No one ever told me these things. I had a really incredible childhood. Don't worry, Dad. <laughs> but <laughs> I think it's something that's internalized in every healthy sibling in some form or another. So I'm gonna use this moment to just tell you to check on your sibling friends. They're affected in ways that are not always obvious, even to themselves. Perhaps the most therapeutic and effective way for me to find a purpose, discover my own role in this community, and to feel closer to Joey, has been through fundraising and running events. While we were still very young, we started attending the Joey Fun film premiere, as well as our other events, like the Hot Dog Safari. We pulled names out of a hat to see who would receive the special bouquet of 65 roses. As we got older, and unfortunately, we're able to document the full range of puberty through these pictures. <laughs> there will be more. The event morphed into something very different for us. We began to actively fundraise, take on more of a role, and bring in groups of our friends. This move, along with our no longer being able to ask for birthday gifts, thank you, mom and dad, and instead ask for donations to the Joey Fund, ended up training an entire generation of children and young adults how to fundraise. For each of the past five years, the Joey O'Donnell film premiere alone has brought in $1 million for CF every year. We just celebrated our 39th year this past fall, and I hope you'll all join us for our 40th. Throughout the rest of my life, I've had these incredibly specific and serendipitous moments that feel almost like they're orchestrated, that make me feel like maybe there's a little nudge coming in from somewhere, someone else, and it's reminding me that all of this is worth doing, and I'm pretty sure that all of you have felt these as well. It's in the sheer number of people that I run into around the world who have been to Joey's Park. It's in getting Joey hat photos sent to me from all over the place. We have a picture of those. Oh, good, more puberty pictures. <laughs> um, by the way, I did bring uh, a ton of Joey Fun hats for everyone to do the same. Sorry, Laura. They're in the back of the room. <laughs> Please bring them on your travels and share the word. It's being connected to Bigel while she wrote Breath from Salt, getting our own mutations tested, and realizing that Joey probably would have benefited, benefited from Trigafta. It's in the time that I studied abroad in London and my randomly assigned flatmate, Lauren, happened to have CF. It's in learning that I'm not the only Kate Alexander in this community. What a legacy for Alex. It's one of my dad's best friends being one of the oldest living people with CF, who is now on Trikafta, and the fact that I met my boyfriend Ryan through him. It's growing up with and meeting all of you in this incredible group of humans and finally feeling like I'm home. It's why we keep going for the nonsense mutations and gene therapy and the 6%. It's how I felt when I was practically adopted by Peter and Angie and Margaret and Mark and Laura and Pam and Casey and the Mass Rhode Island chapter, Pam and Jonathan. 
It's pennies from Jenna, and it's hearts from Summer, and hats from Joey, and bucket lists for Kelsey, and all of you here and sharing in this burden. You all have a different story, and you know exactly what I mean. And that's why we're all here today. And that's why we continue. It's about this community. This group of people has shown me that this is the place where I'm meant to be, and I am so proud to be here. There are a million other things that I could talk about, but there just wouldn't be enough time. So I'll just bring it back to the beginning here and repeat that my story and all of our stories are compilations of everyone else's in this community. One doesn't exist without the other. And while I didn't know him, I do know that Joey is the person that brought me to all of you. And for that, I am incredibly grateful. Thank you.